1956, a boy was riding on a donkey across the Red Sea in Cecil B. DeMille's classic retelling of the Ten Commandments. That boy, John Peters, was making his debut in Hollywood that day, and yet it was the start of a massively successful career, most recently as a producer on the superhero movie Man of Steel. But it was another superhero that spawned our story today, Jim West, or James T. West, the protagonist of the 1999 film Wild Wild West. It was while filming Wild Wild West that the movie star, Will Smith, gave a script that John had been working on since 1993 to the director, Barry Sonnenfield. However, since Wild Wild West didn't do so well in the box office, John's script was put on the back burner until Sonnenfield officially dropped off of the project at the end of 1999. As the century turned in February of 2000, director Michael Mann, who was fresh off of the Academy Award nominated film The Insider, took over as the new director. The film was given a budget of over $100 million and Will Smith was set to star. The script that had started in 1993 as a biographical film about one of boxing's greatest of all time, simply named Ali, was set to go. Will Smith spent the next year of his life training to be a boxer. He spent up to seven hours a day in the ring until, in January of 2001, Ali officially began filming. And so the film that had been in the works for almost a decade took just under a year to get made as it opened on Christmas Day of 2001. Ali was received well by critics, even though it ended up going to be a monetary loss for the studio. Although it wasn't a box office success by the numbers, Will Smith and John Voight would go on to be nominated for their own Academy Awards for the film, for Best Actor and Best Supporting Actor, respectively. After the film's release, Will Smith would say it was the film he was most proud of as an actor, and it tells a very important story of a true legend, Muhammad Ali. But how much of Ali was the truth, and how much was stretched for the film? I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is based on a true story. Our story begins a month after Pearl Harbor on January 17, 1942, when Muhammad Ali was born as Cassius Marcellus Clay Jr. in Louisville, Kentucky. When he was 12 in 1954, Cassius had his bike stolen. And as any 12-year-old would be, Cassius was upset. He actually told a police officer by the name of Joe Martin that he would beat up the thief. Now, Joe happened to also be a boxing coach, and so he suggested that Cassius should learn how to box first before he would beat up the thief. That was Cassius' first introduction to boxing, and soon he'd fall in love with the sport. For the next six years, he worked tirelessly and earned a spot representing the United States in Rome at the 1960 Olympics. As fate would have it, this was also the very first Summer Olympics ever to be telecast in North America, something that CBS paid $394,000, or about $3.17 million in today's dollars, to provide. No doubt this helped launch Cassius into the public's eye as the teenage sensation put on a great show, defeating Poland's Zbigniew Pietrzykowski in the final round to take home gold medal for the United States. None of this is depicted in the movie, though, as the film picks up just as Cassius' triumph in Rome is over, and just before his first fight against Sonny Liston. This fight took place when Cassius was 22. Even though Cassius, who's played by Will Smith in the movie, had just come off a major win that put him in the spotlight after winning a gold medal, no one expected him to beat the established champ, Sonny Liston. Sonny was widely considered the most intimidating fighter of his day, in fact, Henry Cooper, the English heavyweight champion, made it known that he'd happily fight Cassius, but he wouldn't even get into the ring with Sonny. Henry's manager famously said, quote, We don't even want to meet Liston walking down the same street. End quote. Needless to say, Sonny was a frightening opponent. But Cassius wasn't afraid of Sonny. He wanted the title. And so, on February 25th, 1964, in Miami Beach, Florida, one of the greatest boxing matches to date took place between Sonny Liston and Cassius Clay for the World Heavyweight Championship. Part of this heavy favoritism for Sonny was because of their age difference. Cassius was much younger with less experience, although in truth, no one really knows how much. This is mostly because there's no documented proof of Sonny Liston's birth. 
He claimed to be 32 at the time of the fight, 10 years older than Cassius, but most people thought he was closer to 40. What most people didn't know at the time was Sonny had sustained numerous injuries in the past couple of years, earning and defending his title. Secretly, Sonny would resort to heavy icing and ultrasound therapy after each training session. Sonny also believed he'd take care of Cassius without much difficulty. It didn't even cross his mind that he'd lose. Because of this confidence, Sonny didn't really train for the fight. He'd run maybe a mile a day instead of his usual five, eat his fair share of hot dogs and beer, and was even rumored to sleep with prostitutes at training sessions. On the other hand, Cassius hit the training room hard, and he even studied Sonny's previous fights. That's where Cassius learned that Sonny telegraphed his punches with his eye movement. Despite all of this, 43 of the 46 ringside sports writers picked Sonny to win by knockout. A huge part of this was because of Sonny's proven victories in the rings, but also because no one believed Cassius' style of fighting would win in a heavyweight championship. In the movie, Will Smith's version of Cassius is very outspoken, and before the fight, sounds off with Sonny. This actually happened, and many saw it as a method that Cassius used to get into the heads of his opponents, a form of psychological warfare, if you will. In fact, just about every boxer had a nickname, and while Sonny Liston's was Big Bear, Cassius Clay's was Louisville Lip because he was so outspoken. Sonny went into the fight with a record of 35-1 with 24 knockouts, while Cassius was 19-0 with 15 knockouts. The morning of the event, both fighters were required to weigh in. At the weigh-in, Cassius walked into the room wearing a denim jacket that said bear hunting on the back and carried a walking stick. Then he started waving the walking stick and yelling, I'm the champ, tell Sonny I'm here, bring that big ugly bear on. Sonny walked into the room and Cassius brought it up another notch. Someone is going to die at ringside tonight, he shouted at Sonny. You're scared, chump. As they were measuring the fighters anyway, it, when it was Cassius' turn to weigh in, the doctors measured his heart rate at twice its normal rate, 120 beats per minute, with the blood pressure well over the normal at 200 over 100. After the taunting and seeing Cassius's heart rate, the doctor said Cassius was, quote, emotionally unbalanced, scared to death, and liable to crack up before he even enters the ring, end quote. The doctor also said they'd have to check Cassius's heart rate before the fight, and if it didn't go down, the fight would be canceled. So they did, and an hour later, Cassius's heart rate had returned to normal, and the fight went on. Much later, he was quoted as saying, quote, Liston's not afraid of me, but he's afraid of a nut, end quote. He also said, quote, I won't lie, I was scared. It frightened me, just knowing how hard he hit. But I didn't have no choice but to go out and fight. End quote. So, acting crazy was just that, an act. In the movie, Will Smith's version of Cassius Clay spends much of the fight bouncing around Sonny, who's played by Michael Bent in the movie. And this actually happened. In reality, Cassius's style of fighting was very different than any other heavyweight fighters of the time. Cassius was quick and fast on his feet. He used this speed to dance around his opponents and dodge punches. Many assumed this meant, like it did for many lightweight fighters, and also meant he didn't pack as much into his punches. Of course, this wasn't true. The fight was fantastic, and you can actually find it online if you want to watch the original fight. The movie does a pretty good job of depicting the key moments in the fight. As soon as the opening bell rang, Sonny charged at Cassius, determined to end the fight in the first round. Immediately, Cassius' speed came into play. Sonny looked awkward as he lunged, almost slipping as he tried to catch the speedy Cassius. Of course, this didn't help calm Sonny's anger. It did, though, give Cassius more confidence. When the first round ended, Cassius felt great. He had survived. What's more, it didn't seem that Sonny could catch up to him. The second round did even up the fight a little bit as Sonny started to settle down, landing a hard left hook as Cassius was cornered on the ropes. Now in the third round, Cassius did a first. He cut Sonny. Never before in his career had Sonny Liston been cut. It took about 30 seconds into the third round for Cassius to land a combo of punches that cut Sonny's left eye, something that would take eight stitches to close after the fight. New York Times writer Mort Sharnick, who was ringside, would later describe his feelings of the third round. Quote, My God, Cassius Clay is winning this fight. End quote. But a cut wasn't going to end Big Bear Sonny Liston. In fact, it just pissed him off. 
He rallied and unleashed a devastating combination of punches into Cassius' body. Still, as the bell rang and the two fighters returned to their corners, Cassius turned to Sonny and yelled, You big sucker, I got you now. In the movie, something odd happens next, when Will Smith's character returns to the corner after the fourth round and has difficulty seeing. Now this actually happened, even though Cassius mostly kept his distance from Sonny, dancing around the fighter for most of the round, when he returned to the corner, he started complaining that he couldn't see. Something was burning his eyes. Cassius' trainer, Angelo Dundee, who's played by Ron Silver in the movie, didn't know why Cassius couldn't see. He tried washing out his eye, but that didn't help. Then, as the referee came over to see what the commotion was about, Angelo yelled to Cassius, Run! Otherwise, the fight would be over. The ref later on would say that he was just seconds from disqualifying Cassius from the fight, but instead, Cassius ran out and the next round began. After the fight, Cassius said he couldn't even see Sonny for the whole round. He just saw a faint shadow, one that he managed to avoid by circling and dancing around. Somehow, Cassius survived the round. This wasn't really discussed in the movie, but another theory that many raised after the fight was that Sonny's trainers had inadvertently blinded Cassius. Angelo explained his theory after the fight, referring to Sonny's cut man by saying, quote, Joe Polino had used Monsell's solution on that cut. Now what had happened was that probably the kid put his forehead leaning in on the guy because Liston was starting to wear in on those body shots, and my kid, sweating profusely, it went into both eyes." End quote. A couple days after the fight, another heavyweight contender, Eddie Machen, said he thought it was on purpose. He told the press, quote, "...the same thing happened to me when I fought Liston in 1960. I thought my eyes would burn out of my head, and Liston seemed to know it would happen." End quote. Fortunately for Cassius, his vision started to clear up as the two fighters prepared for the sixth round. Then something happened. In the movie, you see Sonny Liston spit out his mouth guard on the ground. The fight is over. Cassius wins. This happened, but there's two different versions as to why Sonny became the first boxer since 1919 to quit a world heavyweight championship while sitting on his stool. In one version of the story, Sonny's shoulder, which had been causing issues due to boxing injuries over the years, was deemed paralyzed by his staff. His crew made the decision to end the fight despite Sonny's protests. When he lost the case, Sonny spit his mouth guard on the ground in disgust. Now, another version of the story is that Sonny simply told his trainers, that's it. They initially thought this meant that Sonny was done toying with Cassius and that he'd come out and end the fight by knocking Cassius out. But Sonny meant that he was done fighting and he indicated this by spitting his mouth guard out on the ground. Regardless of which version is true, the result was the same. Cassius Clay was the new world heavyweight champion. At 22, he was also the youngest to ever claim the title, a record which would be broken in 1986 by a 20-year-old boxer named Mike Tyson. That's when Cassius ran to the ropes and shouted two lines over and over at the sports writers that would be used countless times since. Quote, I'm the greatest, and I shook up the world, end quote. Two days after the fight, on February 27, 1964, Cassius made more waves when he announced he was a member of the Nation of Islam. Immediately, Cassius started going by Cassius X. In the movie, one of Cassius' group is the famous minister and human rights activist Malcolm X. This is very true, and although we don't know what influence Malcolm had on Cassius' name change, we do know that Cassius and Malcolm were good friends at the time, and so it would make sense that there was influence there. In fact, it was Malcolm X who inspired Cassius to join the Nation of Islam. Officially, Cassius X said he changed his name because he didn't want to bear the names handed down by former slave-owning families. Then, on March 6, 1964, the leader of the Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad, announced that Cassius would be renamed Muhammad Ali. Two days later, on March 8, 1964, Malcolm X, the very man who inspired Muhammad to join the Nation of Islam, left the Nation of Islam. Malcolm converted to Sunni Islam, and while he tried to convince Muhammad to join him, Muhammad refused. This certainly wasn't a quick decision by Malcolm, as he had started to grow, quote, disillusioned, end quote, with the Nation of Islam for years. This caused a rift between the two, something that's portrayed fairly accurately in the movie. Now, in the movie, Will Smith's version of Muhammad Ali meets Sanji Roy, who's played by Will Smith's actual wife, Jada Pinkett Smith. 
the movie portrays a quick connection between the two. And in truth, Muhammad met Sanji only a month before the two were married on August 14, 1964. Another pivotal moment in the movie happens when Malcolm X, who's played by Mario Van Peebles, is murdered, shot as he's giving a speech. While the movie isn't really about Malcolm, so it doesn't really focus on his character, this moment is sadly truth. And the moment is portrayed very accurately in the movie. On February 21st, 1965, Malcolm X was just starting a speech for the Organization of Afro-American Unity in Manhattan when a disturbance in the crowds caused chaos. As Malcolm's bodyguards were trying to calm everyone down, a man rushed forward and shot Malcolm in the chest with a sawed-off shotgun. Two other men then joined in, shooting Malcolm as he lay bleeding on the ground. At 3.30 p.m., Malcolm X was declared dead. An autopsy would identify 21 gunshot wounds as the cause of death. All three men who were involved in the shooting, one of whom was beaten to death by the crowd before the police arrived, were identified as members of the Nation of Islam. But this story isn't really about Malcolm X. That's a story for another day. On May 25, 1965, Muhammad Ali and Sonny Liston had a rematch. Although their first fight had been one that lasted much longer than anyone thought it would, the second Ali Liston fight would go down as one of the most controversial fights in boxing history. Around the halfway point of the first round, Sonny threw a left jab. Muhammad dodged, returning the punch with a right of his own. The punch landed square on Sonny's jaw, knocking him to the ground. Sonny rolled over got on his right knee, and then fell back down again. Sonny Liston went down at 1 minute 44 seconds, got back up at 1 minute 54 seconds, and then the fight was over at 2 minutes 12 seconds. It was one of the shortest heavyweight title fights in history. In the movie, it's at this fight where Muhammad gets upset at his wife Sanji for not being quote, dull enough, end quote. While we don't really know the exact verbiage that was used, there's likely some truth in this. Sanji, who was a cocktail waitress when the two met, refused some of the Muslim customs in regarding to dress for women. While this likely wasn't the only reason that they broke up, it was one of the major contributors. The movie makes it sound like they're divorced quickly after the fight, but in truth, the two were divorced on January 10th, 1966. As opposition to the Vietnam War started to heat up, Muhammad, who was a popular figure in the United States at this point, couldn't help but get sucked in. In the movie, there's a moment where Will Smith is on the phone as he's backstage for ABC's Wide World of Sports. He gets upset, saying he failed the draft, and now all of a sudden they're saying he's eligible? While we don't really know how the conversation went down, the basic facts of this are true. As all men are required to do in the United States, when Muhammad Ali turned 18 in 1962, he registered for conscription. But in 1964, his classification was changed after substandard writing and spelling skills caused him to fail the United States Armed Forces qualifying test. But then, two years later, in 1966, due to the growing tensions in the Vietnam War, the U.S. Army lowered their standards. This meant Muhammad, along with thousands of others, were all now suddenly eligible for the draft. In the movie, Will Smith's version of Muhammad Ali refuses to move when the army officer calls for, quote, Cassius Marcellus Clay, end quote. This, too, happened, although there is more to the story. After he was notified of being eligible for the draft, Muhammad made a public statement saying, quote, War is against the teachings of the Quran. I'm not trying to dodge the draft. We are not supposed to take part in no wars unless declared by Allah or the Messenger. We don't take part in Christian wars or wars of any unbelievers." End quote. At another time, Muhammad made a very moving statement saying, quote, Why should they ask me to put on a uniform and go 10,000 miles from home and drop bombs and bullets on brown people in Vietnam when so-called Negro people in Louisville are treated like dogs and denied simple human rights? End quote. Needless to say, Muhammad Ali's public statements, along with the already growing opposition to the bloody war, were an inspiration to many. On April 28, 1967, Muhammad Ali refused to step forward when his name was called. The officer warned him he would be committing a felony if he refused. Again, Muhammad refused to budge. He refused to fight in someone else's war. So he was arrested. 
As a result of the arrest, the New York State Athletic Commission suspended his boxing license, stripping him of his title in the process. Other boxing commissions followed, and within just a few days, Muhammad Ali went from world heavyweight champion to being unable to box in any state. Just like in the movie, Muhammad Ali was found guilty when he went to trial for his refusal on June 27, 1967. It took the jury only 21 minutes of deliberation to deliver the verdict. He appealed, and after a court of appeals upheld the conviction, the case went to the U.S. Supreme Court. In the movie, it seems like there's a long time between the initial verdict and then when Muhammad receives word of the Supreme Court's verdict. This is actually true. It took years, but on June 28, 1971, the U.S. Supreme Court overturned the conviction by a unanimous 8 to nothing decision. Of course, while Muhammad's boxing career may have hit a brick wall while he waited for the Supreme Court's decision, his life went on. In the movie, Muhammad meets a young girl during this time and falls in love with her. This happened when, on August 17, 1967, the 25-year-old Muhammad Ali married the 17-year-old Belinda Boyd. After the two were married, Belinda converted to Islam and then changed her name to Khalila Ali. In 1970, Muhammad won a victory in a federal court that forced the New York Boxing Commission to reinstate his license. Although New York took a while to actually do this, he acted quickly, getting a license from the Atlanta Athletic Commission. And then Muhammad fought the only boxer who was willing to fight him at the time, Jerry Corey. The fight took place on October 26th, and Muhammad won the bout after three rounds. Then, just a couple months later in December, Muhammad fought again, this time in Madison Square Garden against Oscar Bonavena. It wasn't a very great match, but Muhammad did win on a TKO after 15 rounds. Still, Muhammad Ali was back in boxing. But while his license was reinstated, his title was not. That title now belonged to Joe Frazier, a powerful boxer who is 26-0 with 23 knockouts. And so, on March 8, 1971, a fight was set up between Muhammad Ali, who was also undefeated with a record of 31-0 with 25 knockouts, and Joe Frazier. Two undefeated champions battling for the undisputed championship. It was the first time two undefeated boxers had ever fought each other for the heavyweight title. No wonder it was deemed by the press as the fight of the century. The movie's depiction of this is pretty accurate. After a brutal fight that lasted 15 rounds, Joe Fraser was declared the winner by a unanimous decision. It wasn't a knockout, but it was still Muhammad's first loss. And if you have the chance, I'd really recommend looking up the fight online. It's a great match. Almost as soon as he lost, Muhammad wanted a rematch. While he waited and prepared, just like in the movie, Muhammad watched as Joe Fraser lost the title to a new boxer, George Foreman. Muhammad did get his rematch of Joe Frazier, but because Joe had lost to George, it wasn't a title fight. Joe wasn't a fan of Muhammad. His pre-fight antics and psychological tactics may have been an act, but Muhammad went too far in Joe's mind. Joe held a grudge against Muhammad for the rest of his life. It took three years, but Muhammad Ali got his rematch. Muhammad had the upper hand this time, and he beat Joe Frazier on January 28, 1974. But beating Joe wasn't enough. Muhammad still wasn't the champion. And this is where the movie starts to wrap up, when Muhammad Ali fights George Foreman in Kinshasa, Zaire, which is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. This fight took place on October 30th, 1974, and it was affectionately nicknamed the Rumble in the Jungle by the press. George Foreman was an even scarier opponent than Joe Frazier, with a 40-0 record and 37 knockouts at the time. Not to mention, he unseated Joe Frazier as the world heavyweight champion. The fight went down much like it did in the movie. That is, it didn't happen when it was supposed to. Just like it was depicted in the movie, George Foreman was injured in training before the fight. The injury, which was a cut above his eye, meant that the fight had to be postponed a full month. But it also meant that George couldn't do any boxing and training at the risk of reopening the wound. George later said, quote, that was the best thing that happened to Ali when we were in Africa, the fact that I had to get ready for the fight without being able to box." End quote. Meanwhile, Muhammad was training hard, but he was also using the time to hype the fight. 
as was his typical fashion, before the fight, Muhammad Ali tried a psychological approach to get into his opponent's head. In the interviews and hype before the bout, Muhammad was as boisterous as ever. There were four men who would cover the fight. Bob Sheridan did play-by-play, -play, while pro football player Jim Brown and Joe Frazier provided color commentary. The final commentator was David Frost, who we learned about in the episode about the movie Frost Nixon. Muhammad offered this little rhyme to Frost, quote, If you think the world was surprised when Nixon resigned, wait till I whoop performance behind, end quote. Perhaps it was Muhammad's reputation as outspoken nature on civil rights. Perhaps it was his media coverage before the fight. No matter the reason, the people of Zaire loved him. Just like in the movie, anywhere he went, there were chants of Ali, Bomaye, which means Ali, kill him. Muhammad was the clear favorite for the crowd. Not necessarily for those in the boxing world. Muhammad was 32, considered in boxing to be much older than the 25-year-old George Foreman. When the fight between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman finally happened, Muhammad shocked the boxing world again by pulling a move that has since become known as rope-a-dope. Instead of his usual fighting style of dancing around his opponents, it was the exact opposite of what every boxer up to that point had ever done, including Muhammad. Essentially, Muhammad stood by and just let George Foreman, who was one of the hardest hitters in boxing ever, hit him. He, he just took it. Sure, Muhammad got in a few jabs of his own here and there, but for the most part, he just backed up to the ropes and let George tire himself out. Most of George's blows were to Muhammad's body and kidney area. There were a few to the face, but nothing that seemed to phase Muhammad. As the fight went on, George grew increasingly frustrated. He was pounding on Muhammad, but he simply didn't fall. So he started exerting more and more force into his punches. What else could he do? Finally, George started to wear down. He was just getting tired. In the eighth round, George was visibly tiring and Muhammad started to make his move. He started a relentless counterattack. It accumulated with a five-punch combination, the last of which was a left hook that forced George's head to move up and then a devastating right straight to the face. George stumbled back and fell. George paused for a moment and began to get up. He managed to get up at the count of nine, just one second before the end. But the referee stopped the fight. It was over. There were just two seconds left in the round. Against all odds, Muhammad Ali had defeated George Foreman in the Rumble in the Jungle and regained the title. And this is where the movie ends on what many consider to be one of the best fights of all time. But that's not where Muhammad's story ended. In 1975, Muhammad fought Joe Frazier for a third time in Manila in a fight dubbed Thrilla in Manila. In temperatures nearing 100 degrees Fahrenheit, Muhammad won again. The following year, Muhammad earned another victory over Ken Norton in New York. That same year, 1975, Muhammad had some significant changes in his personal life. He left the Nation of Islam, following in the footsteps of his friend and spiritual mentor, the late Malcolm X, by converting to Sunni Islam. He also had an affair with an actress and model, Veronica Portia. Because of this affair, which is touched on a little bit in the movie, Muhammad and Khalila got a divorce in 1977. Muhammad married a pregnant Veronica the same year. In February of 1978, Muhammad lost his heavyweight title to Leon Spinks, but then he won it back again on September 15th of the same year, beating Spinks at the Superdome in New Orleans. After winning, Muhammad announced his retirement from boxing. He was showing his age. He started stuttering with vocal stutters and trembling hands. But Muhammad needed money, so he came out of retirement. He wanted to face Larry Holmes, who had gained the title after Muhammad's retirement. But Larry refused. He knew Muhammad didn't have anything left in the tank, and Larry didn't want to seriously hurt him. Muhammad checked into the Mayo Clinic, who cleared him for fighting. Officially, he was fit for the ring. So, on October 2nd, 1980, and at the age of 38, Muhammad returned to the ring. Larry Holmes dominated. Actor Sylvester Stallone, who was ringside, later said it was, quote, like watching an autopsy on a man who is still alive, end quote. The fight would be the only that Muhammad ever lost by knockout when it was stopped in the 11th round. Muhammad was determined to continue, but his health was in steep decline, something that wasn't helped at all by the defeat by Larry Holmes. 
Muhammad Ali's final fight was on December 11, 1981 at the age of 39 against Trevor Burbick. Muhammad lost in 10 rounds. Two days later, on December 13, 1981, he announced his retirement from boxing, this time for good. Muhammad Ali's final boxing record was 56 wins to only 5 losses. His 56 wins included 37 knockouts and 19 decisions. Well, he had only one TKO and four decisions in his five losses. In 1984, Muhammad was diagnosed with Parkinson's, a disease that most attribute to his boxing-related brain injuries. Many considered the decision to fight Larry Holmes something that significantly accelerated the disease. Two years after his diagnosis, Muhammad and Veronica were divorced, and he married longtime friend Yolanda Williams in 1986. 10 years later and 36 years after he won the gold medal that kicked off his career in the 1960 Olympics in Rome, Muhammad Ali lit the Olympic flame in Atlanta, Georgia during the 1996 games. It was that same year, 1996, that Muhammad was at the Oscars as part of a group receiving awards for When We Were Kings, a great documentary that covered his fight in Zaire against George Foreman. Due to his Parkinson's, Muhammad stumbled trying to get up the steps, and George Foreman helped him up the steps. George would later say, quote, We fought in 1974. That was a long time ago. After 1981, we became best friends. By 1984, we loved each other. I am not closer to anyone else in this life than I am to Muhammad Ali, end quote. Toward the end of his life, Muhammad chose to step out of the public's eye, even though he continued to offer support to various charities. It was just a couple of months ago, on June 3, 2016, that Muhammad Ali passed away at the age of 74. He died as a result of natural causes, and his funeral included eulogies from his closest friends and celebrities who were influenced by his life, including actor Billy Crystal, sportscaster Bryant Gumbel, and former president Bill Clinton. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan Lefebvre. If you want to learn more about the incredibly inspirational life of Muhammad Ali, I'd recommend his autobiography entitled The Greatest, My Own Story, written by, of course, Muhammad himself. You can also find most of his great fights on YouTube or other various sites online. If you're a sports fan, or even if you just want to see what The Greatest did to achieve such admiration from friend and foe alike, I'd really recommend checking them out. As you may have heard in the last episode, Based on a True Story now has a Patreon page. If you're a fan of the show or you want to peek behind the scenes and make this a little bit more of a two-way conversation, you can do that over there. So check it out at patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast. It's all one word. Or you can follow the link from the show notes. You can also find me on Twitter at Dan Lefebvre, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. Until next week, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.